Global Health Threat. And it's really good to see uh, you actually making time this uh, Saturday morning to join us as we actually discuss this. So I'll be, I have a co-moderator, Daniel Wairungi, who is a fellow student as well. I'll ask him to introduce himself before we get into the session. Uh, we will then introduce our two panelists uh, later, just before they do their presentations. Over to you, Daniel. Daniel? I think uh, he was having connection issues in the morning. Um, if I can get a confirmation whether I'm audible and you can hear me from one of the panelists. Yes, we can. Ah, all right, thank you. So Daniel, um, are you on? Can you hear us? Anyway, um, I think we'll catch him on because he really had um, some connectivity issues since the morning. So how we'll start the session is, um, I'll just start by, um, first of all, I would like to give an apology. One of our panelists, uh, Dr. Freddy Kitutu, was not able to join us this morning. Uh, because there's been a funeral in the family. So um, without wasting much time, I'll just give an overview of uh, general research, which is what we um, would want to focus on in this session this morning. And um, following my presentation, we'll have uh, then the other presentations from our fellow panelists. Daniel is back. Daniel, can you hear us now? All right, so welcome. And um, what is research if we are to ask ourselves? I know as students, this is a term we hear every time. It's a term uh, where most of us will end our program by actually doing um, some form of research. And uh, the word research is actually composed of two syllables, re and then search. Re being a prefix meaning I knew or over again. And search is a firm, of course, the word search, we have used it um, a number of times and we know what it means, where we are actually examining closely and carefully to test, to try to probe, we are questioning. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, us as the youth, as the young, we are expectant that uh, if we question what's happening around us, then we'll be able to come up with uh, answers especially to global problems such as uh, AMR. I will not go into detail really for, because there are other panelists who do so, uh, being specific about research in antimicrobial resistance. But uh, for this, I'm just giving just an introductory, um, some introductory remarks on the term for research. As students, we should make sure what, wherever we are, we are asking why, why is this happening? I know most of you actually do this and, uh, when you look at research, we are searching for knowledge. We want to find out um, what can we create? Why is this phenomena there? Why the why, the who, the where, and how different things happen. And it's a systematic investigation to establish facts, solve new or existing problems, prove new ideas, and also develop new theories. And usually this is done using a scientific method. So I'll quickly go through uh, the stages in the research pro uh, process. And um, when we are trying to do research, as I said, we'll do research even as part of uh, the curriculum in the students, uh, as part of your the degree that you are actually doing, 
or you actually do research in your professional life or just as we we should be inquisitive looking at um, what areas can we research about as students to generate new knowledge. That is very important in this world that keeps on changing. As we mentioned, COVID-19 came very unaware and that's an area that definitely would need to research on. If we look at AMR, then that even get the complicated uh, issues. So when you want to start research, the first thing you need to do in the first stage is to establish what the research is about. Identify the issues. For example, a general research questions are like, just like uh, what are the main causes of deaths maybe in children in say Makwene County? And um, it can dwell down now to say uh, how many children, being a specific question, how many children die of malaria? A specific disease in the county and looking at what are the causes, why, where is it happening? If it's in Makwene County, who, who are the people that we are trying to examine to question about the children? Why? What are we looking at? And the researcher needs to be knowledgeable about the area of study and avoid research questions that cannot be answered or have already been answered. So of course there are there's body of knowledge. A lot of researchers who have come before us and will be there after us. But it's important that we research on uh, an area that um, we are knowledgeable and passionate about, not necessarily very knowledgeable about, because we are trying to be inquisitive and search uh, for new knowledge. So the second stage is, um, I know you have done this even as part of your curriculum, especially the students that are in their final years who have gone through this because you actually come up with research proposals. So I'll just quickly go through all these stages. Um, the second one is what is already known. This we call literature review. Um, where you're actually looking at the body of knowledge in your area of interest and acquaint yourself with what is available. Identify some knowledge in the field of study. Elaborate on the key issues that need to be tested whilst in the field. So it's good that we've got a lot of um, resources available uh, online and um, quite a lot of um, publications where we can actually refer to. For us to establish, before we go and do our own research, what have the previous researchers found out? Because that is very important and it ends with other recommendations that you can actually build on as you do your research. And um, how is this research to be done? It's good to determine your, this is the methodology part where we are looking at uh, the sample design, um, which will be, we all know that a sample is a segment of the population selected. That would be, representing uh, the bigger population. So it's important that um, we specify what information is to be collected from which individuals and under which uh, research uh, conditions. We need to actually come up with uh, the sample frame and also look at uh, who is to be surveyed, how many people, what sample size are we coming up with? And we have to make sure, as I said in the beginning, that uh, usually scientific methods are actually applied so that you make sure that uh, whatever research you come up with will be something at least uh, that can be generalized to the population. And that then dwells down to the research design methods and um, coming up with a sample size that um, actually makes sense and can also be then used to ensure that whatever knowledge we are generating the future students and anyone else reading the work that you have done will be able to gain new knowledge as well. And um, when we look at, yeah, I had actually touched on these stages. I was talking about um, when we are determining uh, the methods that are going to be used, you define the key variables as well, and then select your prepared test to be employed. Here, the objectives of the research should really be, I'm sure most of you know that, um, when you do not have an objective that is smart, it will be very difficult now to, even as we are collecting your data, what are we really looking at? So it's important that um, the objectives of the research are clear, the methods of the data collection should be adopted, and also the source of the information. We really need to know. Um, and also the tools for the data collection, what are we going to use? 
this year is actually good because uh, there's a lot of use of technology that makes our life easy. So as we determine the tools for data collection, it's good to go uh, to use the, the actually online methods which help us instead of the paper forms that you have to read and type in again. So using um, tools such as the Google Forms, the Survey Monkey can be really good when you're doing uh, determining how to collect your data. Then of course the data analysis methods, what to do, how you get to analyze the data. How can you check your plans? Uh, do your small trial. It's always good to pilot uh, before you go to the field and revise your methods based on what you find um, during this pilot uh, period. And stage six is um, how do you collect the information now? I think we all know about um, the issues that we have to be ethical, to be truthful, respectful, and also thorough because we are trying to make sure that whatever knowledge we are getting is something that um, can be at least relied upon. So it's very, very important to be truthful and not say we have collected data from this uh, place where you have never visited, which is really not a good uh, thing in research. We are actually supposed to go to our, wherever we have committed to go and collect data from, should actually be on the ground. And as I, I talked about technology before, I'm sure you know that these days it's actually a good thing because you can collect even the GPS uh, coordinates from the areas that uh, you will be actually doing your research. Um, stage seven, uh, how you interpret and summarize your data. When you have collected data analysis is key, which should actually be, as I uh, said, as part of your planning in stage three, I mentioned the data analysis. You have to then say, when I go to the field, I've collected my data, I'm using this tool, how am I going to analyze it? And, um, you know, rushed analysis often leads to inaccurate results and misleading conclusions. It is good that we summarize our data in a way that is, it is easily understood and it provides answers to our original questions. It would be very good to hear that uh, quite a number of these students have actually done research on AMR and their research has actually led to uh, different students across the globe or other stakeholders working in AMR. As we say, the AMR is a very um, complex problem that has a lot of multi-stakeholders working on it. So whatever data we get, you never know, maybe the um, the data that's coming from, I see we've got students from Kenya, we've got students in Tanzania, maybe the body of knowledge, whatever you have researched on, on your topic on antimicrobial resistance might actually be very helpful in uh, your fellow scientists in the future decisions that they have to do. Because, um, so when we are doing research, we should be um, cognizant of the fact that whatever knowledge we are generating can actually inform and be very helpful for, evidence-based decision-making to our fellow scientists, especially for such complex problems such as AMR. And um, I wanted to talk about this uh, very briefly, this research reporting, which is stage eight. It will be good to have a very good report that can actually be published. So when we are writing our reports, uh, it's important to make sure that key points are addressed and there's a checklist. Uh, I know there is actually, there will be samples for most of the universities of how your research report should look at, but it is important that we explain the purpose or aim of the research, explain why the research was necessary. We all know the justification of the study and describe in detail how the research was done and how you arrived at your, um, with your conclusion. Then, um, if you look at the types of research, uh, there is quantitative and qualitative. And quantitative research relies up on random sampling and produces the results that are easy to summarize, compare, and generalize because you are looking at numerical values where you are saying 25% of uh, this, where I realized that uh, maybe you are doing a research on antibiotic use, uh, 
30% of this sample, uh, the health facilities I was looking at, this type of antibiotic was used and all. Then qualitative uh, looks at information that is produced based on the researchers' observations. Um, data obtained through this research methodology access and check against participants uh, subjective reporting of what they believe and do. Uh, the methods that we normally use here are normally interviews, observation, oral history, or surveys, where we are looking at uh, what people are, what are people feeling about the topic. Um, participants, people's behaviors, activities, what they do, how frequently. And also this method actually enables the researcher to develop familiarity with the culture and also the context of what is happening. In addition to just having the quantitative where we are saying a certain percentage of the respondents to this research, we're doing this, but it also uh, further goes on to look understanding the problem better. If you are going to be analyzing or researching about a problem, uh, so it's also important to make sure that if we do qualitative research, maybe there are focus group discussions that we have done. We should make sure whatever methodology we are using, at the end of the day, the data that we, uh, the information that we get is something that can be useful for people to make uh, future decisions. So there are interviews, which I talked uh, briefly about, uh, I'll just quickly go through these uh, slides that are dwelling down to interviews. Some can be structured or unstructured. And uh, for structured interviews, uh, the researcher actually prepares a set of questions and try to uh, obtain answers to these questions. And structured interviews is where the researcher only has a topic and not set questions. And then you go, especially in qualitative research, this is very good because you're trying to probe and try to maybe find out the underlying reasons why people do something. If it's uh, attitude or the, the, whether it's cultural beliefs, like I think we'll have a discussion with the other panelists where we are talking about, you know, COVID-19, there's a lot of hesitancy in taking the vaccine, things like that. Why is that happening? So that uh, can be useful. Um, so when we are going to do research and we are selecting the people to be interviewed, it's important that you do not interview people you know very well personally. Because well, sometimes you lose the track of what yes, the, the topic under discussion and also use your contact so that you'll be able to get more people to interview that are relevant for the topic that you are doing and contact the people you want to study and always introduce yourself and what you are going to do. Actually, for I'll talk about informed consent and uh, also ethical clearings before the end of the presentation. What you do during the interview, the interview should last as long as necessary to obtain the needed answers and also if possible record it so that you'll be able to get the data well and make sure that the, all the preset questions are answered, especially for the structured uh, interview. It's important to be respectful, friendly and accepting and do not argue with your interviewees, even if they do not believe in what you are saying or they totally say whatever research you are doing does not make sense. So you should not judge them uh, right or wrong, but instead gather as much information, as much data as possible, because this can actually be very good when you then do your final analysis. And talk to them at their own speed with their choice of topics so that it is as participatory as possible. Um, and make sure the environment you are in is not, um, it doesn't have distractions and also do not ask embarrassing or awkward questions, especially if it's in public. If it's a topic that you feel it needs to be in a public, in a private place, make sure you do that and be organized and not jump from one subject to another. And um, counseling, for example, summarizing responses too early make sure that you give the interviewee time to actually respond to the question and not summarize what you think they are saying. Um, recording interviews, uh, I talked about that and writing notes at the same time, use of technology, the audio recording helpful when you're doing your data analysis, ask clear questions, 
single questions, open-ended questions. Uh, you can use different type of questions as the next slides will see. Um, and just quickly going through this because we are not uh, going to be really looking at how we are going to do the interview, but just as a way to give a general overview, we'll share these slides with you as well. So you can go through them as well. The type of questions that we have are open-ended, closed-ended, and open-ended are the ones where you want to probe and get more information. Closed-ended, very useful in structured interviews where you just want a yes or no or simple short uh, questions. So the open-ended, as I have said, um, have a fixed limit. Example, how are you doing today? Encourages continued, the open-ended questions, they, they encourage you to probe more and uh, gain more interview, more information on the topic that you'll be looking for. And um, as I said, I don't want to dwell too much on these uh, techniques for inter interviewing, but um, if someone is really interested about this, you can then look at it uh, in the slides. I'll go through to good conduct when you're doing your research. It's important that um, when doing your research, dress in a way that um, has a, people can be able to accept you and maintain a friendly zone, especially when you go to cultural, you should be aware that the culture of the people that I'm going to see, there are some people who will not take you seriously the moment they see you wearing, dressing in a certain way. So it's important to have that in mind. Um, maintain a friendly tone with positive body language, show interest in your own topic. Be polite and respectful and of course professional. Probe and ask more questions and listen to those who are asking questions and be open. Uh, issues to consider in research, this is very important. There is need to get uh, informed consent uh, for the people that you'll be getting your data from. And also confidentiality is very important because if someone trusts you to open up and tell they tell you what has been happening to them or they are giving you information that you need, maybe regarding some um, prescribing practices that are happening, say it's a certain health facility. And uh, you're supposed to make sure that the confidentiality that you get as you do this informed consent from the respondents is actually maintained. And in addition to that, um, it is important that um, you actually make it formal if it means you have people sign, especially where for health matters, it's important that you actually have a signed uh, informed consent. And it's important that uh, confidentiality is maintained, as I said. And um, what I wanted to, before I end the presentation, I wanted to talk about uh, ethical clearance. This is a very important thing when we are doing research. I know there, in different countries, there are actually bodies that regularize uh, research, such as the, in Kenya, I know there's the National Commission for Science, Technology, and Innovation, NACOSTI, that actually ha has the uh, national uh, general, uh, mm -hmm. that gives authority and clearance for people to be able to conduct research. And in the various institutions, the universities, they are also, bodies that actually give ethical clearance and uh, give you um, the clearance and the authorization before you actually go and conduct research. So it's important that before we do any research, we get this ethical clearance. And in that, we'll then have all these things of inform informed consent. So thank you so much. I hope I haven't bored you with uh, things that you already knew about in research, but I just thought it would be important for us to just uh, remind ourselves of uh, the important things in research and uh, how you conduct research. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Daniel. Um, thank you, Julian, for that. I hope I am audible. Yes. Yeah, sorry for that. I think I had a problem with my device. Thank you once more, Julian, for taking us through the basic aspects of research, the stages in research, uh, juxtaposing between qualitative and quantitative research, the process of interviewing, uh, the good conducts and concepts, and also the issues that we need to consider when undertaking research. So I will invite our second speaker, that is Mr. Tapmane Mashe, uh, maybe a brief profile about Mr. Marshall. Uh, 
Mr. Tabmasha is, uh, works as a medical laboratory scientist at the Ministry of Health and Child Care, and he's also the national AMR coordinator in Zimbabwe. And as a member of the Zimbabwe AMR Research and Development, as well as the Surveillance Technical work, Working Group, he's involved in the implementation of Zimbabwe AMR National Action Plan, AMR Research, and AMR Diplomacy. So welcome. Mr. Mashe, it's really glad to have you on board today. Yeah, and you can take us through. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much, Julian, for setting the, the, the background. It was a very interesting uh, presentation that you did. Uh, for me, my, my task is a bit easy because I'm going straight into AMR opportunities. So I will share my screen. I would also want to welcome all the students and everyone else who have joined this webinar. So let me share my screen. So, so my presentation for this morning is entitled The Present and Future Opportunities in Antimicrobial Resistant Researches. So as, as, as Julian has already said the best, and she has like explained well uh, what is a research, what needs to be done. So for me, that part already, I'm not going to, to dwell much, much about it, but what I'm going to do is just to focus on opportunities which are available for students to focus on. I think this history, you know, and the background about antimicrobial resistance, you know, and uh, these are some of the statements uh, which uh, uh, were spoken by uh, Margaret Chan, uh, the former uh, director of WHO. So, I'll just read one of the interesting uh, quotes, which says, without harmonized and immediate action on a global scale, the world is heading towards a post-antibiotic uh, era in which common infections could once kill again. So because of this now, there's need uh, for, 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 for everyone, including students, to do research, to check what is happening, and to see and quantify antimicrobial resistance in different areas. So because of the uh, this uh, uh, statement and the agreement between WHA, OIE, and FAO, uh, uh, they, they were forced, I can say, they were forced to develop what you call global action plan on antimicrobial resistance. I'll go through it so that you have a, a, an understanding of it. So what they did now was to develop five uh, strategic objectives, which are of interest. And I think for this presentation, I'm going to dwell much on these ones why both these ones will lead us into what opportunities of research topics or research areas uh, can we get from this? So these five objectives, I'll just read uh, and you are also seeing them. Improve awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance. So that was one of the, the, the global key, uh, strategic objective we agreed to say uh, for AMR, what we need is to understand uh, and improve awareness of antimicrobial resistance. Then another thing, we they agreed was also to say, you need to strengthen knowledge through surveillance and research. So this issue of research is very, very important. And it's one of the, of the a key a, a global a strategic a, objective. Then another thing which they agreed was to say, we need to reduce instant of infection. So this also a, a, a touches the issue of biosecurity a, in the animal health sector. So another key objectives which they agreed to say, we need to focus on was also to optimize the use of antimicrobial resistance, uh, which I know I have seen a lot of pharmacists, including Daniel. So they said, okay, we know that we have antimicrobials which are already there, and how best we are supposed to save those antimicrobials. We need to optimize their use, and this also includes uh, antimicrobial stewardship. So the last uh, uh, global uh, strategic objective we agreed uh, to focus on was to develop economic skills for sustainable investment that takes into account the needs of all countries, uh, increased investment in new medicine, uh, diagnostic tools, vaccines, and other intervention. So these were the five strategic objectives which these uh, uh, global leaders agreed to focus on. So the participants were WHO, FAO, and OIE, and many other uh, international organizations. So after that, they said, all countries need to develop what we call nation action plan. And I know most of the African countries, they've developed those nation action plans. So for this presentation, and I'll focus on each 
strategic objectives and what are the possible uh, research opportunities for each strategic objectives. So let me go straight to the first uh, strategic objective. So for, for the first strategic objective, which is to improve awareness on AMR, there are so many opportunities which people can, can look at and can focus on. So what I've done, I've just picked uh, researches which has been done so far on this strategy objective. These are just uh, my sample, but there are so many researches which has been done so far. So just to give you an idea. So uh, someone in Nigeria decided to check and to do a, a national survey on public awareness on antimicrobial resistance in Nigeria. That was a research which was published. You can look for the, for the article and read it. It was very interesting just to check uh, what is the public awareness on antimicrobial resistance. Then another one said, okay, let me just check how, uh, 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 how the antimicrobial use and, 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 and antibiotic resistance. This was also a public uh, survey which was done in, in Cyprus. So the other one, which is the raising awareness on antimicrobial resistance was also done in Japan. Then another one, okay, in the UK said, no, uh, I also want to see uh, what is the role of, of public engagement activities. So this one did uh, raising awareness and antimicrobial resistance among a uh, general public in the UK. So you can just uh, Google all these researches. These are very interesting ones. Then another one in Vietnam, which is uh, Southeast Asia uh, said, okay, I would want to see the public awareness and of antimicrobial use and resistance among residents in highland uh, areas in, in, in Vietnam. Then this one, the last one, which is a, a very good one, I think you also need to, to look at it. It's a systematic review, which uh, we're focusing on the surveys of knowledge and awareness of antibiotic use and antimicrobial in general, in general population. So this one, they did a, a systematic review to check uh, which researches has been published uh, about this topic, and uh, they, they draw some conclusions, very interesting conclusions. So you can look at this uh, research and, and read it for yourself. Then the second strategic objective, which is to strengthen the knowledge on AMR uh, through surveillance. That's a very interesting one. So this one is a, it's a very broad one. So I've tried just to give you a few examples. examples. Because of time. Because of time. So um, the first one, which I, the, the approach for this one was to say, okay, let me give you the general uh, uh, surveillance uh, uh, programs which has been reported. Though for surveillance, you can still focus on individual organisms. So I also have a, a bit of examples of individual organisms. So there's also a, a surveillance. This was more like a, a systematic review also. Uh, antimicrobial resistance surveillance in low and middle income countries, uh, progress challenges in eight Southeast Asian country, uh, South, uh, South Asia and East Asian uh, countries. So this was more of an assessment to, to check what are the challenges and the progress made uh, concerning uh, surveillance, antimicrobial surveillance in these Asian countries. You can look for the article, it's also a very good one. Then there was this one also, which is surveillance of antimicrobial resistance uh, in Europe, it's a very, very good report. For this one, uh, they checked, you know, all the 26 European countries, they reported and they have a structure of uh, uh, doing surveillance in antimicrobial resistance. So they were reporting for all organisms to say uh, uh, what was the resistant pattern of E. coli in, in, in UK, E. coli in, 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 in Spain, E. coli in France. So I just thought to, to, to give you an example of, of, of national surveillance uh, programs for individual organisms. So this was just for uh, Salmonella, uh, Tephmerium, and, and, and the one that we also did uh, in Zimbabwe, which was uh, uh, characterization of Salmonella type uh, in Zimbabwe. So this was also a very interesting one where we, uh, we tried to check uh, Salmonella type uh, strains uh, from 2009 up to 2017. So as you know that uh, typhoid, the first typhoid case in Zimbabwe was reported in 2009. And uh, from those uh, uh, strains, we, we, we kept the, the, those old strains and we did we started now doing surveillance of the typhoid in Zimbabwe as far as 2009 up to, we are still even doing it, but this was just a, a research that, that we did to check if there are any changes. And out of this uh, 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 track, which is the, the, the surveillance track that we're doing on typhoid, we discovered that 
in 2014, that's where the, the TIF strains started to, 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 to become resistant to, to, to ciprofloxacin. In 2016, there was an increase. Then in 2018, we had a big outbreak of, of cipro resistant strains of TIF. And because of the results uh, that we had and that we had managed to, 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 to gather, we even advised the government to say, why can't we introduce vaccination? And as you know, uh, in 2019, uh, Zimbabwe uh, uh, did a mass uh, typhoid vaccination in eight affected suburbs. So in Africa, Zimbabwe is one which did a mass uh, typhoid vaccination through surveillance of, of, of soft, soft, salmonella typhi in Zimbabwe. So, so these uh, studies and these researches can also yield positive results even uh, to change policies. So now uh, in 20, 2021, uh, the government decided to say they are now going to include a uh, typhoid vaccine as part of routine uh, uh, vaccine and everyone else will, will get it. Then another interesting one is to reduce infection uh, and or incidence of infection. So that's the, the third uh, global strategic objective. So there's also this uh, 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 systematic review or uh, literature review the study, they say the infection control and, and the research priorities. I think for this one, you need to, to look at it and read it. It's a very interesting uh, article which focuses on research priorities uh, in, in infection control. Then, okay, uh, then another one was the AMR ineffective infection prevention control measures. That's also a very good one. You need to, to read it. Because of uh, AMR and, 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 and the uh, IPC, uh, there was need uh, for, 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 for global leaders to have a, a journal. So there's also a very good journal, uh, which is called the Antimicrobial Disease and Infection Control, which has also a very good impact factor of 3.6. And this uh, journal is affiliated, uh, I think I thought because we are, we are from Africa, it is affiliated to Infection Control uh, Africa Network, though it's also affiliated to the international infection control body. But I thought maybe, let me just give you an example of the African uh, uh, body, which, is, which, is, which it is affiliated to. So if you uh, go, go and check on it, they have a lot of uh, AMR and infection control researches which are being published uh, uh, on this journal. So last, uh, last, last example, which I thought maybe it's also going to ring bell to some of our, our, our agricultural guys to, is, to, is, is this one. Association between antimicrobial use, biosecurity measures, as well as farm performance in German uh, uh, farrow to finish, uh, to finish farm. So this, was, this is also a very good, interesting uh, study which was conducted in German to link between antimicrobial use and, 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 and biosecurity uh, measures in, in, in these farms which they, they looked at. Okay, then another another interesting one, which is the optimized use. I've seen there are a lot of pharmacists who have joined the core, is to optimize the use of antimicrobial agents. So on this one, you can do so many uh, so many researches. I, I've just picked a few, and uh, and there are plenty. Uh, you can uh, go and check for yourself. So this first one, which I thought is of of interest, is effectiveness of alternative alternative uh, measures to reduce antimicrobial use in pig production in four European countries. So this was also a very good uh, study which was done in Europe. Then another one, which is antimicrobial use and resistant in animals. Uh, then antimicrobial use and resistant in animals. This was also a Belgian initiative where they were looking at antimicrobial use and resistance in animals. There's another interesting one, uh, which is uh, focusing on Africa. is antimicrobial use and resistant food producing animals and environment in an African perspective. So then I know, I know, I know uh, we cannot uh, 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 skip this interesting one, which is the value of hospital antimicrobial strategy programs. So as you know, one of, of, of the main pillars, I, I think uh, Dr. Muffin is going to, to dwell much on this one. One of the main pillars of MR is antimicrobial strategy. So you can also do a study to check how, what is the value of these choices programs. So this was a, a systematic review. So you can go uh, look at it and it's a very interesting systematic review. Then lastly, 
I thought maybe it's also good uh, to, 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 to share this one. And this one was the impact of antimicrobial surety program implementation at five tertiary private hospitals. Uh, and so this one now was now checking what was the impact of these uh, programs uh, and, and how effective were these programs. So the last uh, um, strategic objectives, uh, which I thought uh, is of interest and it's, it's also of value, it can, it can also open uh, so many uh, research opportunities uh, for young people or for everyone else who wants to do MRI research is this one. To increase investment in new medicine, diagnostic tools, vaccines, and other interventions. So on this one now, I thought, okay, let me just pick a few uh, initiatives uh, which are at present. So uh, I, I also came across this interesting uh, new research which was published this year, uh, leveraging vaccines to reduce antimicrobial use and prevent antimicrobial resistance, uh, a WHO action framework. So you can check on this one, how the world is moving uh, and how the world wants uh, to, 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 to prevent AMR using uh, vaccines. So the other one, which was published in, uh, in 2019 is the impact of vaccines on AMR. And then also another one which was published this year also is the role of vaccines in combating antimicrobial resistance. So these are also uh, alternative methods that we uh, can be used uh, to reduce AMR. So the vaccine world is pushing hard and it's true that vaccine, they have an impact. Uh, and then the other one, which I thought is also of interest is the diagnostic test. Uh, and, and how the diagnostic tests are linked to antimicrobial resistance. So with all these uh, uh, points, with all these researches, which I just uh, thought I would like to share with you, there are so many opportunities. I think as you uh, have seen, you can do many things and you can uh, look at uh, these things at a different level and if they're different eyes. So I would urge you, to go deep and, and look at these five objectives and develop some uh, interesting uh, research questions that you can answer and also help your country and help your institution uh, to combat AMR. With these words, I want to thank you and I want to thank everyone and I want to thank also REACT for inviting me. Over to you, uh, Julian. So for those ones who'd want maybe to, 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 to email me, even to check me on Twitter, these are my contact details. Over to you, uh, Julian. Thank you so much, uh, Tapuma. Uh, Daniel, are you on the call? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Mashe, for really exposing us to the different areas uh, that we can partake research on and also showcasing the different researches that have been done before, especially I love how you have aligned them with the five objectives of the National Action Plan. And it has been quite uh, insightful for me and I have learned a lot from that and also how to really uh, identify areas that we can research on. And also Julian has shared, please, as we continue, if you have a question, feel free to share in the Q&A session. We will address them afterwards. So uh, inviting our next speaker, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Marfin Mpundo. So Dr. Marfin is the director of REACT Africa and the partnerships and stakeholder engagement lead for the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance. Uh, it's based in Denmark and, uh, sorry, the partnerships and stakeholder engagement lead for the International C Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions, uh, that is ICARS, responsible for Africa and uh, yeah, it's headquartered in Denmark. He's also a honorary, honorary fellow at the University of KwaZulu-Nato. Dr. Mpundu is a registered clinical pharmacist and a public health specialist with over 30 years of extensive experience in global health policy and security. And he's a global advocate for AMR and equitable access to healthcare. And he's passionate about providing multiple stakeholders with technical support in AMR national action plans development and 
implementation. Uh, I met with Dr. Muffin yesterday and I can share that he was quite very resourceful and very insightful. And I could really see his passion, the passion that he has in addressing antimicrobial resistance. So welcome on Dr. Mpundu and uh, the floor is yours. Feel free to present. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a great honor to uh, to join you. I hope you can uh, you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you, Doctor okay. Martin. Yeah, I'm in a place where there is a, a little bit of some background uh, noise, but this is where I normally get the best of uh, of the signal. So I I sincerely want to thank you. Um, uh, certainly, I think for uh, uh, this great organization, both yourself and uh, uh, Julian, it's so great to be able to engage with students on matters that matter most, matters of life. Uh, the two earlier presenters have, uh, have literally done everything. So I don't think I have uh, a lot to add to what they have done. But what I'll do is that I'll I'll just get us through um, some elements when where I see that uh, there is a bit of some work to be done in the area of uh, of actually connecting COVID and antimicrobial resistance. So without um, much ado, I want to thank you participants also. I'll do a quick review of the optimization of antibiotic use. I'll describe the process that has affected uh, uh, by COVID-19, and then I'll review some evidence that is available. And lastly, uh, I hope I can challenge you on some areas that you can consider for research. So as clearly has uh, been mentioned, uh, we've been dealing with two pandemics. The first one uh, is actually COVID-19 that uh, generally almost everybody knows, even little kids, they can tell you something about COVID. But there's been a silent, there's been a silent pandemic called antimicrobial resistance, and that has been looming just below and simmering and uh, has a lot of challenges for us if we have to address it. Our previous speaker did an eloquent uh, uh, presentation giving the background uh, of the global initiative, especially looking at the global action plan uh, that has translated in a number of countries developing their national action plans. And in implementing um, those national action plans to address or to contain this problem of antimicrobial resistance. And uh, for those that are not familiar with this whole concept is that uh, we have a lot of uh, antimicrobials, especially antibiotics currently, that are just not working to the, uh, the current uh, bacteria and pathogens that cause diseases. Making the treatment of things like a simple urinary tract infection, a simple respiratory tract infection, making conducting of surgeries very difficult because we need to cover a patient with antibiotics so they don't get infected during surgery and after surgery. It's, uh, we are having problems to be able to uh, treat cancers because patients with cancer are already immunocompromised. Some antibiotics are effective in treating cancer but they are also effective in preventing these patients that have a low immunity from getting infections. We have seen with tuberculosis, for example, that there's a, a lot of resistance to a number of TB drugs that have led uh, a lot of patients uh, either to suffer for many years and some of them to die. So 
this is a sort of quandary that we find ourselves in. And in approaching that, we have to do it in a very integrated way. And I think Dr. Amasha had given a very good presentation. You know, uh, we have to be able to integrate uh, issues around surveillance. And when we talk about surveillance, it tells us uh, what we are dealing with. What are these pathogens that are giving us problems? How prevalent are they? What antibiotics are available? What antibiotics can this bacteria or this virus uh, respond to? And uh, uh, we look at issues of regulation. You know that in our East African countries, including most African countries, you can walk into any Dukaladawa, any pharmacy, any market, you can buy any antibiotics, including IV solutions. So regulations are really important. We have a challenge of supply chain management. Most of the people that live in Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is known for one of the major things is that this is where we have a, a very high prevalence of infectious diseases. But we also have poor supply chain systems. Uh, we have so many stockouts of useful antibiotics that are not just available in hospital facilities, uh, which cause patients uh, to get worse and unfortunately some of them to die because there is no treatment. Uh, the access to uh, these critical antibiotics is a major issue. The misuse that's there again for um, in the human sector, people don't want to be seen by a doctor, they don't believe the labs, they just want to walk into a Dukaladawa, buy anything they can buy and take those items. So these are some of the factors that cause that. So we are in a pandemic. What are some of the things that we have seen? There have been many changes in health systems. Uh, during the pandemic, it's difficult for you to go for routine care because the priorities have been towards uh, really seeing those patients uh, that are coming in with COVID. And in some of the countries, uh, literally the whole hospital is literally filled with patients um, who've got COVID. There's fear, there's anxiety among the community, among patients. There's the delay in um, really going for care because you don't know you'll be seen. Uh, you have to join a very long line. Uh, the changes I talked about in supply chain, uh, diagnostics are not in hospitals. Uh, we have issues around uh, uh, medicines themselves. The countries were closed. Medicines could not come in. Diagnostics could not come in. We have issues around testing. And again, uh, these are gaps in terms of having a very good surveillance program. We have issues in terms of the protective equipment. We have hospitals where you know, our nurses have to wear one set of gloves the whole day. And you can imagine how those gloves are get dating and how infections are moved from one patient to another. So these are some of the, some of the challenges uh, in a bit of a detail. I mean, supply chain disruptions, you know, we, you know, that has been huge. We've got actually workers and some of the factories uh, that have been manufacturing antibiotics and even those manufacturing some of the current vaccines, sometimes they've been able to close because one, two, 10 patients, I mean, um, 10 workers have had COVID and if they've got COVID, you close, I mean, uh, you close the entire plant. And one of the things that you have to understand is that uh, there are very few manufacturers of certain medicines. There are medicines, for example, benzathine penicillin that is used in the treatment of gonorrhea. It's only manufactured by two manufacturers in the world. So if those companies close because of COVID, then there is really a major disruption. We've got the hardest seat areas in terms of um, uh, really where antibiotics are produced. Most of the factories in China had closed. Most of the factories in India had closed. Most of the factories in, uh, uh, in Malaysia had closed. And so we didn't have uh, really medicines coming in and there was a disruption in uh, lots of treatment. The regulations that our governments have come up, 
uh, the travel restrictions, uh, staying at home, the curfews like here in Kenya, make it difficult for patients to seek any care because they can't travel to a facility where they can be seen. A restriction in movement has meant that the medical supplies, including medicines, have been a challenge. When one looks at access, again, because of uh, 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 because patients can't access uh, uh, the public sector, they can't use some of their insurance, they are now paying out of pocket at a, at a pharmacy, a private hospital, that might see them. And uh, that there's been hardsh economic hardships, uh, people have lost jobs, that's the reality of the pandemic. There have been actually facilities that are quite overwhelmed and uh, there's been a decrease um, in the raising of funds for these facilities and make further investments. We've had challenges in terms of immunizations. Uh, uh, the routine immunizations uh, uh, are not being taken by patients because they are not being supplied anyway into the rural areas. Those that are privileged to live in major cities, in Dar es Salaam, in Kampala, uh, 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 in Nairobi, in Accra, you may be able to access that. But once you move out of the major cities, these sort of immunizations are not there. We've had a redeployment of staff. Most staff now are concentrating on the COVID response, which compromises the other services uh, in the hospitals. And then vaccine availability, of course, has gone down as um, uh, most international industries that manufacture all these vaccines are not in place. We've had challenges with surveillance programs. We've challenges in terms of testing facilities. Our labs are not fully functional and they've been repurposed to focus now on COVID-19, on doing tests, on doing, um, on, uh, 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 doing genomic studies, uh, to know about the mutate, I mean, uh, 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 these mutants and understanding uh, 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 and this genomic sequencing. And so our labs are being turned now into really surveillance labs and forgetting about the routine care. There are shortages of um, uh, these reagents, it's so common, shortages in terms of human resources. Uh, 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 most human resources, they are getting so tired, so fed up of, you know, being overworked many hours and infection and prevention pr uh, uh, practice, uh, uh, it's, it's a challenge. Most of our hospitals uh, in most of our countries, uh, they don't have running water. So how can you talk about uh, infection prevention when you don't have any running water? They don't have hand sanitizers. They like PPEs. They are given two pairs of gloves for the whole day if they are lucky. In some places, one pair of gloves. And so all these actually continue to, uh, um, to cause more infections. And uh, uh, the pandemic uh, uh, studies and research that has been done, there's been some rapid research being done without really following uh, uh, the rigorous uh, uh, process and procedures that actually uh, uh, Julian presented. If you're gonna do a scientific studies, there are protocols to follow. You've got to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, these protocols, a good sample size, uh, a good sample size that will give you good statistical, uh, really evaluation and power to clearly say our results of this research has given us, uh, this is new information and what. Uh, there's been a push for rapid publications I could have given so many examples, but because of time, I'm not going to do that. And the many articles that are coming out are really are retrospective, and they look at very small samples. We need studies that look at bigger samples that are going to have, uh, you know, uh, 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 much meaning um, um, in terms of the results of um, uh, uh, those research. We kick, yeah, we quickly know about the prevention of. Um, uh, of COVID and most infections, you know, uh, vaccines are one of them, you know, uh, uh, they really are effective in preventing infection. But we've, I mean, uh, everybody almost knows now, hand washing with soap and water, around sneezing and coughing, around, the, I mean, uh, 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 the social distancing, you know, we know that we just can't be very close to each other. About protective equipment, 
But whether these things are happening, uh, you guys have to tell me. And I just thought I should uh, mention just a few slides about virology because one of the issues that we are having now when the COVID vaccines are moving into countries is that we are having a lot of vaccine hesitancy. We're having a lot of lies, a lot of disinformation, a lot of misinformation, a lot of um, skeptics and coming up with um, useless uh, mythologies and things about vaccines. So this slide, I just wanted you to see how viruses affect the cell. So you've got the virus in that blue little what uh, that attaches uh, uh, to a cell receptor uh, uh, that you have. And uh, uh, the cell is going to get it into its, uh, uh, its body. And what viruses do is that, you know, uh, they replicate and they produce uh, uh, some protein. And so they'll do the protein synthesis and uh, they'll come up uh, with another virus. That virus will, will enter the endoplasmic uh, reticulum and, and finally it will be expelled. And when it is expelled, you have now new viruses that are coming up. And some of these viruses are now are coming out with a new genetic composition. That's where we talk about the, I mean, uh, uh, these mutants. How does the host respond? The host cell responds uh, uh, basically in three ways, uh, uh, through the cytotic uh, uh, T cells. And, uh, you know, these are the cells uh, uh, that recognizes that, oh, you know, uh, the cells is being, is being attacked and they will kill that. But there are also interferons uh, that are produced. And this, uh, uh, these interferons, uh, uh, they inhibit replication of viral genetic material. And so they try to stop the virus from uh, uh, really producing um, more of this genetic material. And so they, uh, uh, in such a sense, uh, 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 they express also the substances and the T cells are going to, uh, 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 to actually um, uh, get these viruses and destroy them. But we also have antibodies and uh, these antibodies are, are, are what our cells are going to produce uh, that will attack the, uh, the viruses to, uh, to actually uh, kill them. But I also felt, I think uh, my discussions in the last couple of days uh, uh, in Kenya, since I've been in Kenya the last three, four days, uh, they focused more around this whole misconception around vaccines. And, uh, you know, one of the ways we, pro um, we prevent antimicrobial resistance uh, is by doing vaccines. Vaccines are what we call a very sensitive intervention to address antimicrobial resistance. So uh, there are three main approaches uh, in which we manufacture vaccines. One of the ways is that um, uh, we use an entire virus or an entire bacteria to actually, uh, 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 to actually form a new vaccine. The other way is that uh, uh, we use some parts of a cell, of a bacteria or of a vaccine and uh, I use that uh, to actually trigger really our immune system to be able to respond. And the last one is that uh, uh, we use part of what is in the nucleus, use some of the genetic materials in the nucleus uh, of a cell in which this virus is to actually uh, produce a vaccine. And so uh, I'll quickly just rush through this because uh, I think it's important for you to know because you'll be dealing with friends, you'll be dealing with families, you'll be dealing with churches, that are saying they don't believe in this COVID vaccine and uh, it's very unfortunate. So there are three approaches. If you're gonna use uh, uh, the entire microbe approach or the entire bacteria or virus, you can do it in three ways. One, it's actually inactivating um, this sort of a bacteria. It's, you know, uh, you lower its, uh, its, uh, its uh, um, it's, uh, uh, its veracity. The other way, it's to use a live bacteria or a live virus 
to have the body find a way in which it can respond. But the other way is to look at, uh, at, at the viral vector vaccine uh, by focusing uh, on the interior and using uh, uh, that to do that. So I'll give a few examples, you know, uh, in the inactivated vaccine, what we are trying to do is that, you know, this is a way in which uh, we make it to take the disease carrying virus or bacteria or one very similar to it and inactivate it. Yeah, so we activate it, we kill it by using chemicals, heat or radiation. Examples of these are flu vaccine and polio vaccines. That's how we make polio vaccines. And we, we've been able to eliminate polio almost on the entire continent now of Africa. But the challenge with, uh, uh, with this methodology of using an inactivated vaccine is that it takes a little longer and it needs a minimum of, uh, of about two or three doses. So that's just one of the challenges. It takes uh, longer to produce, but it also takes uh, uh, more than uh, at least two doses. Then the life attenuated vaccine, you know, uh, here we use a living but a weakened version of the virus, one that's very similar to the virus that uh, we are developing a vaccine for. Examples of this are also actually uh, many measles vaccine, mumps vaccine, uh, a rubella, chickenpox, and shingles vaccine are produced in this way. The viral vector vaccine, here what we do is that um, uh, we use a safe virus to deliver a, a specific subparts called proteins. These are just components uh, uh, of what we are going to get into the nucleus of the cell or germ and uh, this is what we use to trigger really a response without causing uh, uh, a disease. But the more recent one that uh, 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 the approach that we are using now, it's a subunit approach. And with this approach, uh, we take a specific part or subunit uh, of a virus or a bacterium that will be able to stimulate uh, uh, the immune system and uh, it will be able to act against the, uh, the bacteria. And what you're going to see when you look at vaccines, uh, uh, really for COVID vaccine is that the approach has been to use either uh, the DNA process, and uh, uh, this is using the genetic material that are in the proteins uh, and um, uh, uh, to use actually mRNA. These are just uh, uh, the way that uh, uh, these proteins have been labeled. And, and generally the DNA goes through a process uh, in which it, uh, um, it transcribes and creates this particle called really a messenger mRNA that has the message. It carries the message for the formation uh, of a new, uh, 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 new, uh, new vaccine, or, I mean, a uh, new, a new gene or, uh, or new mutant gene or a continuation of the same, um, of the same bacteria uh, or virus. We clearly know about transmission that, you know, it goes via the, you know, uh, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. Uh, we know it's the droplet uh, uh, way it is, um, uh, it, it actually, uh, it is actually spread by coughing and sneezing. It's an aerosol and so it can travel about a meter or so. And so that's the reason we talk about 1.5 as a really a good, a good way to social distance. It sits on surfaces. And so if you're touching surfaces, you're touching your eyes, your nose, uh, you know, uh, without cleaning surfaces, it's one way that you get uh, uh, the COVID vaccine. Yeah, yeah, so quickly now to challenge you guys as students, you know, what are the areas that uh, you can look at uh, really for your research. Uh, uh, Julian talked about the methodology and, uh, and, uh, uh, and actually my esteemed colleague from Zimbabwe talked about, you know, uh, really AMR and focusing on uh, those areas under the global and the national action plans uh, uh, in terms of looking at awareness of knowledge, you know, what research can be done on surveillance, infection and prevention control uh, in research and development and also in the appropriate use of antibiotic. So, so for example, in Zambia, I was in Zambia in, um, uh, uh, in uh, 
um, in October and November. One of the things I was working in hospitals with the doctors and pharmacists there, and one of the things that we noticed that um, uh, the patients uh, that were diabetic, if they contracted COVID, the chances, you know, they were the first one to die. And uh, we, we observed that and we started actually collecting data and trying to say, you know, what are we seeing here? So, you know, you know uh, sometimes your research is going to come about because you are seeing a phenomenon. And we saw that with renal patients. Again, the patients who've got, I mean, kidney problems on dialysis, we saw that these guys, uh, the chances of survival was really minimal. You know, you can be able to track and understand uh, uh, factors, uh, you, know, you know, is there a connection between COVID and some of the diseases, you know, do they make it worse? You know, those are things that uh, uh, really you can look at. Uh, you can be able to also uh, look at, you know, we know that, you know, uh, there is an increase in antibiotic use in patients that are infected with the COVID, uh, I mean, uh, with the COVID virus. And one of the reasons is because of secondary infections that come about and uh, you wanna treat those, but you also want to protect them. But we've also found that, you know, um, yeah, that over 50% of antibiotic used are really unnecessary in these patients uh, because they don't do anything. You can look at the reasons of skeptics uh, in our society that are now connecting uh, uh, COVID to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, biblical things like 666. No, they'll put a chip in your body and you know, uh, uh, they'll be monitoring you. There's a lot of nonsense, COVID doesn't exist. You know, there's so much of this around and it's important that we, we actually uh, know about these things and we are disseminating and doing research to prove that uh, what these guys are saying is not true. We can study why are people refusing to get the COVID vaccine. I've heard of so many people in uh, many countries that are saying, I'm not gonna get it, you know, you know, and they've come up with so many of these reasons. But also, you can also try to ask a question as a researcher, has antibiotic use gone up during COVID or it has gone down? And if it has gone up, why are we seeing that the use of antibiotics has really gone up? And which antibiotics have gone up? I know in some countries that actually, I mean, uh, 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 what uh, azithromycin, for example, uh, went up because people were queuing for it because uh, they learned that, oh, really, Zithromax is being given to uh, these patients with COVID and zinc and vitamin C. And so in some countries, these have actually uh, uh, run out completely. And there is, uh, it's, it's important when we're looking at, uh, you know, really antibiotics and uh, really antimicrobials and trying to see what the differences are. And important to also know that uh, uh, the secondary bacterial infections that occur in COVID patients, uh, uh, we end up using over 50% of antibiotics. Really, antimicrobials include um, really antibiotics, antivirals, antiparasitics, and antifungals. So let me, yeah, let me end with a few slides to show you things that you guys can uh, look at. This is one of the country I visited and I was very shocked because uh, I was all masked and normally I move with a gown, I mean, uh, uh, with the face shield. So I'm in this supermarket, the, the rules and the regulations for the country are clear. Everyone has to mask, patients have to mask. You tell me, our one, the patient has where? the mask is under the chin. The second one, this is, uh, this is a worker in the store. They are stocking things. Uh, and where is it? It's again where? Below the chin. Look at this other side. And you, you clearly know that we spread COVID virus by coughing, by breathing, by allowing ourselves uh, not to, pro you know, masks are not meant 
to be worn on a chin as a symbol of status uh, or being cool. We have the influence of power. We have some power and political leaders who for, for a while have promoted that, you know, there's no coronavirus. These are research areas that you can look at and say, you know, what is the influence of political leadership that claims that coronavirus or antimicrobial resistance is a hoax? You know, so you can look at those studies and try and do that. Our neighboring country here where we are, we've had issues in Tanzania where, you know, you have a president who does not believe in COVID and who has downplayed it. And we know, we know that, I mean, thousands of people have died. Uh, in the last three weeks, I mean, 50 people in the Catholic Church, nuns and fathers have died in Tanzania. Why? Because this has been promoted. These are areas that you guys can reach, can be able to research on why are these things happening? How can we intervene? How can we allow, allow the hospital system, the professionals in our country, raise the voice and engage with governments that don't believe in that? Tanzanian leaders denies again COVID-19, but countrymen push back. You know, so why are countrymen pushing back? So, you know, those are, those are good areas for research that you can uh, look at. Just this week, a couple of days ago in Kenya, this was something that came out in the Kenyan paper. Well, the Catholic doctors say that, I mean, COVID-19 is unnecessary. And again, unfortunately, these are doctors, these are scientists, but it means that even amongst our scientists, we have our differences, but they are also these guys who don't believe in it. And, you know, and so what does that do? You have you have back the Catholic Church is one of the largest churches in the world. And if this is what's coming out, how many, how many people are dying? We have got these myths about spirituality. Oh, you know, when you get the vaccine, um, it's the mark of the beast. And so don't get it. You know, all this which is completely utter nonsense. We are in an age of misinformation, disinformation, an age of lack of information, an age where anything can uh, run very fast, a lie can go very fast. Are there possible areas for you guys to research? Yeah, do we know what we want? What is the gap analysis? What are the objectives of our study? What is the methodology? These are things that uh, you need to be actually uh, uh, looking at. And I mentioned about um, uh, the Zambia study, and I also mentioned that, you know, uh, uh, most of the studies are. If you're doing a study, it's gotta be rigorous. You've got to be able not to push your publication because it's going to backfire. There were many publications that were done in, uh, in the Lancet, the British Medical Journal, which have been pushed back because they came out of Wuhan, uh, uh, China with uh, a very simple, a very small, a very small study population and you cannot draw conclusive results if all you have is a very small population. But you know, the, the fact is that we also have to be examples. I personally have been vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. I've taken the two series. It is scientifically makes sense. Vaccines have protected so many diseases. I talked about polio, I talked about measles, I talked about, uh, you know, I don't know about that kind of chicken pox, uh, you know, so many of these vaccines, they're effective. When you get a chance, be a champion in your community, in your school, to say vaccines work. When your chance comes, my friends, to have a vaccine for COVID, protect yourself, protect your family, protect your neighbors, protect people you interact with, do the right thing. If nobody is masking, nobody is social distancing, do that. So there are a lot of areas, colleagues, that uh, you can actually work through. I mean, uh, uh, those areas that actually Marsha talked about, the areas that I've talked about, and the other areas. But you can conduct research that is scientifically based and uh, that can have a lot of influence 
and change a lot of behaviors and activities. And with that, I just want to thank you for your hearing and uh, uh, look forward for, uh, uh, for engagement uh, uh, in terms of a few questions, if you have any. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mathin, for that uh, excellent and very well detailed uh, presentation. I'm sure we have all learned a lot, starting from the access issues, the viral life cycle, and also the how important vaccines are and how um, COVID-19 has impacted, of course, um, access issues. And um, we have all been challenged, um, the students, I think you will agree, that even the research areas that have been suggested by uh, both the presenters, they've really, really challenged uh, you uh, to actually think um, outside the box and see which areas you can look at uh, if you look at uh, the areas that uh, Dr. Meffin has highlighted, like the comorbidities, the myths as well, which unfortunately scientists, as you said, are also part of the ones, uh, of course, uh, following some of the myths that are not substantiated by any science at all. So um, you agree that when we register for this webinar, we actually did it in a way that you completed the Google form and you shared the questions that you wanted uh, the panelists to address. And their presentation has actually addressed most of the questions that came up from the summary that we did for the questions we had given. So I think uh, I'll just uh, pose a question to Dr. Mathin, maybe just to highlight uh, one of the questions that I have here from the students that says, is it possible that the use of different antimicrobials in managing COVID-19 are causing the emergence of mutated, mutated strains of the virus? And um, before you respond, I'll also give a question to uh, Mr. Marshall that has come. What, in your opinion, is the best way forward to reduce AMR in Africa and beyond? So I can start with Dr. Mathin. I don't know whether you got the question. Unfortunately, you were cutting. I didn't catch the whole question. Right. There's a question here that says, is it possible that the use of different uh, antimicrobials in managing COVID-19 yeah. are causing the emergence of mutated, mutated strains of the virus? OK. Yeah. That, yeah. So. That's an excellent question. Uh, yeah, so the first thing that uh, has to be very clearly understood is that uh, antibiotics don't act on uh, viruses. They have no ability at all to, uh, to act on, on, uh, uh, on a virus. And uh, uh, the Antibiotics act on bacteria. So a bacteria is one organism and one family. Viruses is another family. So only an antiviral can act on a virus. And we did not have, we don't have currently any antiviral drugs that can act on the COVID. There is a lot of production that's going on. My presentation was shorter. I could have shown you more around the production that's going on. And so viruses um, need uh, antiviruses. It's like, it's like the way HIV is. An antibiotic will not act uh, on, on HIV. We need an antiviral. What? Yeah, yeah, what an antibiotic is going to do is that uh, uh, the viruses uh, end up lowering the immunity of someone and uh, they, it's easier for them to get an infection. So when we are giving someone an antiviral and an, uh, then an antibiotic, what we are targeting is the infection that is caused by a bacteria. That's why if if the diarrhea you have is being caused by a virus, uh, 
an antibiotic cannot work. If the flu that you have is a viral flu, you give an antibiotic, it's not going to work. So that's actually, uh, you know, and there is this whole misconception. I'm glad you brought up the question, but the very simple answer is uh, that antibiotics, antibacterials uh, have no action at all on antiviral, you know, uh, 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 on viruses, just like antivirals cannot act on bacteria. They just, uh, you know, uh, 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 the mode of action, the way they are developed is completely different. And so that's the, you know, uh, that's the major difference that you have there. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mechen. Uh, Mr. Mashen, um, what is, in your opinion, is the best way forward to reduce the AMR in Africa and beyond? I'll post that question to you. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Thank you so much okay. for the question, uh, Julia. So there are so many ways in Africa we can uh, implement so many uh, uh, things that we can do to reduce uh, antimicrobial resistance. I think we've explained, I think also Dr. Miffin has explained to say uh, the main reason for, 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 for increase in antimicrobial resistant pathogens is the use of antimicrobials. So I think he also touched on the link between uh, AMR and COVID as, as, as he has explained to say, a lot of people now are now getting uh, uh, azithromycin as a prophylactic drug uh, or maybe in, in in case that maybe these people are going to suffer on, on bacterial infection. So the only way which I also think it works well when, we, when, we, when it comes to issues to do with antimicrobial resistance is to reduce the amount of antimicrobials that we, we give to people. So, so stewardship activities, I think, are key. So I think countries need to, to, to implement stewardship activities then another interesting one, as you know, that most of the antimicrobials or, or the antibiotics that we use are also being used in the animal sector. So there's need also to control the animal sector side where these uh, antimicrobials are being given to animals. And some of the antimicrobials given to animals are just being sold uh, over the counter. So we also need to reduce the amount of antimicrobials which are being given in the animal sector. And another way of doing that is to ban in the use of antimicrobials as growth, as growth promoters. Now, another interesting uh, uh, point also is to try to reduce infection. I think there is also a link uh, between a reduction of a, a spread of AMR pathogens with, 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 with implementing uh, infection control or control measures such as the hand hygiene. So it's a it's a cocktail of of, of, of things that can be done. Uh, to reduce antimicrobial resistance in Africa. And maybe some of the, the, the things is also to introduce va uh, vaccines. I think for all those uh, diseases which can be uh, controlled by, by vaccination, we also need to introduce a, a vaccine. We have seen that in Zimbabwe. I, I told you that when we did our, 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 our study to check the prevalence of ciprofloxacin uh, resistance uh, typhoid, uh, strains uh, circulating in Zimbabwe, we found that uh, it was the, the, the strains were increasingly uh, being abandoned in, in different areas. And we, we, we decided as a government to say, let's use a, a vaccine. As I can tell you, though we, we, we don't have a, a proper study uh, to, to, to check the impact of it, but we have seen a decrease. Uh, in one infection rate and also in antimicrobial resistance. So that's another way of, of, of doing it is also to intrude, introduce uh, vaccines uh, to these uh, diseases which are uh, vaccine preventable. Over to you. Julian. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mashe for that. I think uh, Julian has experienced some uh, internet problems. Uh, so I'll take it over from here. Yeah, thank you. It was really uh, an insightful uh, response. 
Uh, maybe I can take one question from the Q&A session and I will direct it to Dr. Muffin. Uh, Bryson Kinga says, thank you for the session. Just one question. Is there any study linking COVID-19 and antimicrobial resistance? Dr. Muffin? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. So the, uh, there are quite a number of studies that, uh, that are currently uh, are going on. Uh, one of the earlier studies uh, that, um, uh, I mean, the earlier studies uh, uh, between um, uh, January last year and getting probably into about October, most of them focused on this issue around uh, the use of antibiotics in COVID patients, uh, trying to understand, number one, if there was any benefit in that. Number two, it was to look at the, at the patients uh, that had been mm -hmm. sick who were given uh, um, uh, both oxygen, antibiotics, uh, whether there was a great improvement uh, in those patients or not. And uh, as expected, I think out of that result was that uh, it, it, it yielded into um, the very fact that uh, there wasn't any significant difference but one has to understand why was the thinking of trying to do such a study? That study was based on the fact that uh, if a patient has got a viral infection, more than likely they will have secondary infections and the secondary infection are going to be bacterial. And so the, the practice in uh, most of the doctors, uh, whether it was in China, it was in the US or it was in the UK and Europe, was that let's give patients antibiotic as a prophylactic way to prevent secondary infections. So you have studies where over 50% received antibiotics. The only ones who needed that were only 5% or 10%. And the 40% plus didn't need any antibiotics. And so, yeah, those studies are, are actually have been done. A lot of studies are going on. If you recall, this, this I mean, uh, uh, the development of the COVID vaccine has been one of the fastest development uh, uh, in history. And most vaccines, when vaccines are developed, uh, they go through a rigorous, I mean, clinical trial and uh, uh, the average production of the new vaccine um, is no less than four or five years. And so there's been a fast track uh, on these vaccines um, and uh, a lot of investment uh, in the newer development of the vaccines, not on the antibiotics. This is a purely viral, uh, viral vaccine. But the other studies that are going on needs to is to understand the progression of this disease. And for example, I gave the study that we started in uh, 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 Zambia with some of the doctors, you know, why are patients who are diabetic having the worst outcomes? So trying to understand again, what is that difference? You have heard of stories and uh, have so much evidence that, you know, uh, the children, uh, don't, uh, you know, don't easily get COVID. You know, it's a completely new field and there are a lot of studies that are starting, uh, but also this is the first time that um, uh, we are doing a, a study that is look, you know, uh, vaccines, vaccines for, uh, for a disease that are looking at using the, the you know, uh, the nuclear components using both a DNA and an RNA, uh, this has not been done in history, you know? And so these are good methodologies where, you know, uh, they've been done and tried, they haven't succeeded, but we, yeah, uh, we now have two sets of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, two sets of vaccine, uh, one that is based on the DNA, the other one that is based on the RNA. 
and each one has got its own advantages and uh, it has disadvantages. The other thing also to understand is that uh, these are new vaccines. What they have proved is that they can work. We have some that would work over 60%, 80% coverage. And, uh, but we, it's too early for us to tell what some of the side effects are going to be. You know, and, so, and so those studies are, are, are really uh, um, going on. And uh, there was a question uh, in the chat that I'll just address uh, uh, very, very briefly, uh, that uh, uh, there is, uh, we don't have any new antibiotics. The fact of the matter is that since 1978, we've not had any new antibiotics. And the reason is simple, is that antibiotics are not profitable. The pharmaceutical industry has moved towards manufacturing drugs for non-communicable diseases like hypertension, hypertension, asthma, heart disease, and all those. Why have they done that? It's because they make more money there. If they diagnose you, for example, with hypertension at the age of 23, and you live up to the age of 85 or 100 years, you are hooked on those, on those drugs. You have to take them daily for, I don't know, 60 years, 50 years. It's more profitable. It's not profitable to actually manufacture antibiotics. That's a very simple uh, issue around economics. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muffin. Um, at this stage, and you have answered all the questions that we had, I'll ask uh, Mr. Mashe to just give his uh, closing remarks following your excellent presentation, where I'm sure students have been challenged uh, in the various research areas following uh, the Global Action Plan uh, objectives. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Julian. I think from my end, I would just want to thank React and everyone else who followed this uh, webinar to say uh, the door is open for research in Africa, even in the world. There are so many research questions which needs to be answered. So my advice to everyone is just go and look at the Global Action Plan. From there, you see that there are so many opportunities and, and so what the world wants is information about AMR. As you know that there's little information uh, uh, about AMR and what we just now need to know is to look for that information and that information is there. So my first uh, uh, assignment to everyone is to just pick your national action plan, look at the objectives. And currently I think one of the, the major, major things which a lot of countries would want to do is to check how this national action plan has been implemented. So it's one of the easiest research area, which I can assure you that you can go and look at the objectives and see how good these objectives were implemented. So above all, just look at the objectives of the global action plan and your national action plan, uh, understand what needs to be done and even at a hospital level, there are so many organisms uh, which the lab is picking and which also the doctors and the pharmacists are also managing. So you need to also just to look at, at it and analyze and see what are the prevalent uh, 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 strains, what are the prevalent uh, serotypes, what are the prevalent bacteria circulating in a hospital. I know there are so many uh, hospital acquired infections happening around uh, different hospitals in Africa. So you can quantify and see how best uh, to manage those cases. So to all the students and to everyone else, my, 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 my last point is to say, let's work together, let's do research, let's help Africa uh, to address AMA. Thank you, over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the, all students have been challenged really. So I'm sure all of us uh, after this session will be looking at the global action plan and also the national action plans, which most African countries actually do have and are available online. Um, over to you, Dr. Meffin, for your closing remarks. No, thanks. I think my mine are very short. I think Mr. Masha said uh, all I could have said. I just want to again thank SARS and uh, uh, REACT. It's been a great collaboration. Um, and uh, 
this was a very timely, important topic. We just wish that, uh, and I hope that uh, uh, we've been able to stimulate the, uh, the students and uh, that, that you found our, our talk and our discussions uh, are meaningful. We don't take this for granted. We just wanna thank each and every participant for joining in and uh, uh, for all these, um, uh, these questions. Uh, uh, wishing you a lovely weekend and, um, and thank you so much. And uh, uh, thanks to you, uh, 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 Daniel and Julian again for uh, really being great moderators for this and also for the intro, uh, the intro um, uh, presentations on the overall principles around research. So thank you so much and wishing everyone uh, the very best. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Muffin. And before we end, um, Daniel, do you have anything to say before we close the session? Yeah, yes, i uh, just passing my regards to everyone. Uh, thank you so much. I start with our panelists, uh, Dr. Marfin and Mr. Mashe for taking your time and really organizing, preparing uh, these presentations for us and the insightful uh, information that you have delivered to us. Uh, thank you to Julian for co-hosting with me and also for taking us through the initial presentation and all the participants for attending the session. As Dr. Muffin has shared, we don't take this for granted. Uh, never undermine uh, your individual effort because you never know who is seeing what you're doing. You may uh, do something small, maybe tweet or uh, uh, say something that can help uh, stimulate action towards COVID-19 or antimicrobial resistance. And in a way you may have uh, converted someone to engaging more on the two topics. So with that, I would like to challenge us to a small Twitter uh, challenge, uh, just a small dissemination forum. Uh, I'm sharing the Twitter handles of our speakers and our host, uh, and also the two organizations in the chat box. Kindly, uh, if you visit our uh, our Twitter handle, you will see some information or also the React handle, uh, uh, the marketing information informing you about the session. Please uh, reply to the to the tweet and indicate the key points that you have. Uh, obtained from this session, at least share something that can help other students who may not have had the chance to attend this session uh, and also communicate something on how we can reduce vaccine hesitancy as you have maybe understood from this session. And for us, we will retweet uh, your key points so that at least we're able to also engage other students and also other people who may not have been able to attend, but are also uh, active on Twitter. As Julian will inform you, we'll also share the recording. Uh, please, when the recording is shared, please share with your different student networks. Let us try and reach as much people as possible so that we have a lot of action going on in Africa in regards to AMR and COVID-19. With that, I wish you all a wonderful weekend and all the best in your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, All yeah. has been said, uh, so I, mine is just to thank you so much and um, uh, we'll continue with this work. There's a lot to be done and we've been challenged in the different research areas. As uh, we have said, we'll share the slides, we'll also share the link so that at least the youth as the change agents, uh, we are looking up to you to have as the future leaders to fight this uh, global pandemic uh, of AMR and have research that will of, of course inform uh, policy and also provide evidence. So we hope uh, moving on, your commitment has been shown just by attending this session. Um, so going forward, I'm sure you'll go on with this and challenge yourselves so that you can actually come up with researches that you never know what they can actually inform so thank you and to the panelists, uh, Dr. Methin, Mr. Mashe, those presentations were excellent and managed to actually address what the students were asking in the form that we, when we collected uh, questions that they had regarding this topic. 
So thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and feel free to continue engaging on social media. You can contact us, even uh, React Africa. We are open to supporting uh, students. Dr. Mephin is very passionate about uh, supporting students. I think Daniel mentioned uh, earlier on that yesterday, we were actually meeting with uh, some of the students I saw here, Wanjiru, um, the winners for the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week competition that we had last year. And um, so feel free if you have any question or you need any further uh, guidance for whatever work you'll be doing, React Africa is actually open to support. And I know Mr. Mashe is passionate about research. So if you also have any question. Uh, hello, Julian. Uh, we seem to have lost you. Yeah, so maybe I can. Please feel free to engage even after this. Bye.